All right, it is, uh, it is 3.01, so we'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. Um, the, uh, present here in the boardroom are uh, uh, Ms. Scott, Ms. Cash, Mr. Haggerty, and Ms. Carter, as well as Superintendent Moore. Uh, currently, no one else is online, so I'll keep a, an eye out for that. Uh, but we have a full contingent of the Facilities Committee, and welcome to uh, any in the public who are joining us as well. We have a number of things on the agenda today, uh, and uh, look forward to uh, really worthwhile discussion, particularly focusing on understanding how and when we use the modular units. This is one of the topics that we've talked about on and off quite regularly uh, as a board and came up in some of our facilities strategic planning discussions. Uh, so I think the, the discussion today will be quite important uh, on that. We also uh, will learn about a very important joint use agreement, which again, these joint use agreements are really important to us as a school system. Partnering with our community uh, is extremely important and uh, frankly, having our municipalities and the county and us work together, that's really what we should be doing in government because it really maximizes the services that can be provided to our constituents. All right, so before we jump into that uh, agenda, uh, can I have a motion to approve the minutes from our last meeting? Mr. Haggerty. Uh, thank you, Chairman Martin. I have reviewed the minutes of the October 11th uh, meeting and move their adoption. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed, same sign. The minutes are passed. All right, so let us begin. Ms. Parker, uh, introduction to the uh, joint use agreement, and this has to do with the property uh, down off Hilltop, Need Hilltop Needmore Road in Fuquay Verena High School, around Fu in Fuquay Verena. Um, you will remember that um, uh, we purchased land and the county purchased land and we have a variety of agreements between them and so this will be information related to that. Uh, please know that there will be three items in next week's board meeting related to this. We thought it would be appropriate to have the discussion uh, here so that if there are issues or anything, any discussion we want to have, that can be not done now. Uh, as it currently stands, one of those items will be on the consent agenda and two items will be on the action agenda. So just so you're aware, uh, and we want to do the work today in committee uh, before that comes to us uh, at the board meeting. Obviously, more th things can be done at the board meeting if needed, but sometimes it's best to do the work here in, work so in the committee. Absolutely. The board meeting, that's helpful. Yeah, thank you. All right, Ms. Parker. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. There's been one uh, evolution since we last spoke, Dr. Martin, um, and that is I understand that all three items are set for action. I think there was some, uh, there's some timing relational confusion in the way the praises are written. We had presumed the two consent would be approved and then we'd be speaking about the other. So for clarity, we're going to go through all three on action uh, very efficiently, but all three at the board meeting. All, all of that is, in, in, Got it. We, we just went through executive and an executive, one was on consent and two are on action. You're right. Some, there will be some combination thereof when right. we come to the actual meeting uh, ne next Tuesday. That's right, thank you. It's late breaking news. Um, we have pulled up on Google our PowerPoint presentation. There you have it. Um, I'm pleased to come before you today to share our, our news of progress on our collaboration with the town of Fuquay Verena. Uh, for more than two years now, we've been working with the town on a school park development for Hilltop Needmore Road Elementary School and the town's community center north active adult center at Hilltop Needmore Town Park and Preserve. Our objectives here today... Can, thank you. Thank you. Our objectives today are to review the steps that we've taken so far to get to this stage, 
to share the updated master plan, to preview the items that are coming forward for your approval that Dr. Martin mentioned next week, uh, that are all necessary to support the development of the facilities, and then to address any questions that you may have. Um, the board acquired the site in 2018, and in 2019 entered an interlocal agreement, or ILA, with the town just before they acquired the adjacent park site. The ILA is a collaborative agreement for the mutually beneficial development of the school and park sites. The master planning process envisioned in the ILA is designed to develop a cohesive school, community center, and park layout that promotes complementary usage, efficiency, and cost savings in construction and infrastructure with the long-term maintenance plan that's mutually beneficial to both while being good stewards of taxpayer dollars. Consistent with the ILA, we have collaboratively master planned the site in good faith without respect to property boundaries. And in full anticipation that an exchange would happen, this is a successful model we've used several times before, and it's been successful here as well. On October 17th of this year, our coordinated planning efforts progressed from conceptual to actual, and you may recall that you approved an ILA for infrastructure provision on these projects for the purpose of providing the water services necessary to the site. We've now finalized a site master plan, along with the terms and conditions of those agreements necessary to implement the ILA and facilitate development. The town approved these measures at its meeting last week on September 7th, and since the master plan requires the realignment of the common boundary line, an exchange of property is necessary, and to the extent that might be considered surplus property, we have already approached the county, and at their meeting last week, they've declined interest in the acquisition of the bits and slivers that we're planning to exchange. So that brings us to September 21st. That's when those agreements that the town has approved will come back to you for your approval next week. Uh, this is a copy of the updated proposed master plan. It's jointly recommended by school and town staff. It was previously approved by this board prior to finalizing the town's programs. The key updates are to the master plan are changes to the town's building footprint and parking layouts. The connection point of the shared western driveway at Hilltop Nemore Road and the connection point at the town site access at the shared eastern driveway. Betty, yeah. if I can just interrupt for a second, just for the board members' understanding. Animations don't PDF, so there are a few animations that, including one that's right now, the red arrows, <laughs> that's not in, if you're looking on your laptop, you won't see it. Got it. Um, and, and I apologize, I think this may be a little beyond the reach of our clicker. If you'll pardon me, let me, let me see what I do. You'll do it, there we have it. Got it. And I apologize for that. So no other adjustments were made to the school footprint or the standard elements. They are still uh, the same as what you saw before. So with that, there are three agreements that we're going to, preview to review today. The first is the First Amendment to the Interlocal Agreement. Uh, we're proposing this to further clarify the Interlocal Agreement, approve the Master Plan, and address the rights and responsibilities of the parties for development, design, construction, operate and operation and maintenance, and use of board and town properties. Under the First Amendment, the board agrees to construct all standard school programs, as depicted on the master plan as components of the standard education program. To support school site design flexibility and to be able to maintain the pedestrian access to the greenways currently on the properties, the board will relocate the greenways at board expense. Greenway, greenway relocations include removing those expected to lie within construction areas, construction of temporary greenways to route ongoing public pedestrian use around active construction areas, and the construction of new permanent greenways, as you've seen on the master plan. With this framework, the board will maintain the temporary greenways until they're closed and removed, and the new permanent greenways will be dedicated and maintained by the town. Under the same amendment, the board is responsible for constructing the shared stormwater device that was depicted on the master plan. 
the town will be responsible for its proportionate share of cost based on flow calculations. The construction and maintenance of the shared stormwater pond is more economical and provides more efficient use of land and enhanced slight flexibility than would have the construction of separate stormwater facilities. The design of this pond is intended to ensure that it's aesthetically compatible with the park setting as well. So approval of that agreement will be necessary to proceed. In. The second document set is the land exchange. As I mentioned, we designed without borders with the intention of creating a subsequent recombination plant uh, to adjust for those acreage shifts to align the amenities with ownership. This is the same approach that we've employed before. And as I mentioned, the land to be conveyed to the town has to be first declared as surplus. So part of this process will be the board's resolution to declare it as surplus property. We've developed a recombination plat to memorialize the boundaries of the board and town properties. The value of the acreage to be owned by each party after the exchange is substantially the same as that initially acquired by each party. So no additional compensation is due from one party to the other. So approval of that recombination plat and the cross conveyancing deeds will be necessary. The third document we'll be bringing you is the joint use agreement. We've worked with the town to memorialize the rights and responsibilities for shared use and shared maintenance responsibilities of certain school and park site elements. It also talks about the collaboration on provision of utility easements and services coordination during construction and design. So the collaboration will continue for the most efficient development of the two projects. Now, to help understand the land exchange, um, this is a graphic depiction that uh, gives you an idea of where the final sites will be versus the current sites. So by consensus, we've established a common boundary line that provides for the location of the, well, let me back up a step. Uh, you'll see a red dotted line that begins near the uh, northeastern driveway, comes down and across the property. That's the current boundary line. So once all the exchanges are complete, all that's in the bluish purple color will be the school site. All that's in the green will be the town site. And there is additional acreage that's part of the town site that's further south, all part of one parcel, but this is what's been used for design purposes. So what's going to remain um, on the school property Okay, let me back up. For those pieces that are on the town property, it will include the main drive entrance, the community center site, the greenways and adjoining park areas, and the shared stormwater maintenance pond. By comparison, the board property will accommodate the bus drive, the access points to Brushy Meadows Drive along the west, the elementary school program areas, including the parking areas and play fields, and those are all located on board property. So this arrangement best aligns property ownership with the intended use, and it sets clear expectations for both public and staff as to responsible parties for maintenance and for availability of use of the site. Under General Statute 168 274, the board is authorized to convey property to another governmental entity on the terms and conditions it deems wise with or without compensation and that's what's proposed here, since we've considered the land to be of comparable value. It is not of comparable acreage. Under the proposed recombination, just over 0 0.05 acres will be dedicated as public right of way, and that's the orange stripe you see along the northern boundary. It's necessary to dedicate the additional right of way for Hilltop Meadmore Road. And the town's combination of parcels, which includes the piece that's beyond the view here, will increase from 19.45 acres to approximately 24.86 acres. The board's property will decrease from approximately 21 acres to approximately 15.16 acres. While the acreage exchange is not equivalent, both entities have agreed that the property is equivalent in value when considering the respective plan development programs, easements, and shared infrastructure identified in the agreements between the parties and on the master plan. So for these reasons, staff will recommend adoption of a resolution in order declaring the board property to be exchanged as surplus, authorizing execution and recordation of the recombination plat, and execution of the necessary cross conveyancing deeds to make the land exchange happen. 
as to the joint areas, uh, joint use areas, we've identified the joint use agreement that provides for the town's use of elements on the school site, as well as some school elements use on the town site. The town shared use would include those that you see on the far left. Uh, they are primarily the access routes often on the property, as well as after hours use of the two parking lots that are just north of the building. On the flip side of that, for the board licensed areas, uh, the board will be able to use the greenways on town property, as well as the drive access. So that clearly sort of delineates on the town property maintenance responsibilities and all the necessary accesses for amenities are, are there. Uh, on the right, there will be cross access easements that provide both parties clear and unfettered access to use those through ways that are necessary to access all the requisite parts of the site. Now, I recognize that that's a whole lot of information in a hurry. One thing I did wanna take a moment and note is to acknowledge and express the appreciation of the town's continued partnerships. Both entities work collaboratively and in the best interest of our shared public. The master plan, exchange of property, uh, ILA amendment and the joint use are the result of several years of coordination, effective communication, hard work, trust, and vision by both staffs and their consultants. Based on the information that we preview with you today, I'm happy to address any questions. It's our um, plan to recommend approval of all these items at your next meeting and advance the projects in accordance with the master plan. And of course, we always appreciate the county they were kind enough to, to expedite the declination of interest in the surplus property. And they are also collaborating with the town to provide some additional funding for the school park project. Now with that, and with apologies for my technology stumble, uh, what questions can I answer for you today? Questions? Ms. Carter. I don't have any questions, but I just want to thank you for going through. That was a lot of information, but you really thoroughly explained it. And I think that that's helpful to know going in and as we are making decisions. So thank you. Thank you. And I apologize for the speed of it. If nothing else, I thought if you, if you heard it once at the action agenda item, uh, you would have some time to think about anything that comes to mind between now and then. Ms. Johnson Hustler. One follow up question. Um, as you know, we're going through quite the opposite on the side of as we transition Fuquay Middle from the current location to the new location. So, so I guess my question is, do you all do these isolated and separate and apart or has this property joint use agreement been in conversation as we switch from one middle school to the new one? Since the town is no longer gonna keep its agreement with the current middle school. Correct. Because they're moving. Right. Um, let me be sure I understand your question. Fuquay has chosen not to continue to maintain the field at Fuquay Middle, which was the main source of their joint use agreement. Right. A lot of that had to do with the inability to use coming through the COVID process and the short term nature of that as it transitions to the new space. As the plans progress, we will continue to speak with the town about their interest in a joint use at the other site. Um, the preliminary interest was not to enter one at this time um, because that's a project where it is solely being developed by the school system. We did inquire as to whether they were interested in an early joint use that would allow them to add lights, add irrigation, mm -hmm. add additional parking, and they were not in a position to do it at that time. So they, they looked at it, they considered it, it wasn't on their list of priorities. I think they're also balancing their own funding needs with their own parks and recreation plans and developing a center like this, I think gives them uh, a, a greater value for the dollar for the participation that they can have of the community on this site. So I don't think it's that they didn't want to or weren't collaborative. I just think it wasn't as high a priority as this one was. But we continue to have open dialogues with them about any joint use opportunities that we can develop together. Perfect, um, and last question, because I, you answered my question, but I still have a piece that I'm not sure of. So they aren't going to, at this time, go into a joint use agreement for the new middle school? 
we haven't gone into one at this time that would affect their investment in improvements to our educational components. Right. Once it's built, if they have a park need that drives a use in that area, we are absolutely opening to, to discussing that sort of shared use with them. It has not progressed to that point yet. Keep in mind our site plan has been submitted, but initial reviews haven't come back yet. So un until the plan is, is a little more firmly gelled, I'm not sure they would be in a position to have a lot of detailed discussions that, that are close to entering an agreement. So I, I think my answer is not yet. I don't know that it's a no. Okay, thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you for the information. And uh, <clears throat> this is one of those things where it just seemed wise to go through it so we know what it is that we're voting on. Oftentimes, there's a lot of stuff that comes through. We can't look at every uh, piece of detail um, uh, in this kind of a setting, but I think it is really helpful for us to have that information and, again, to really uh, celebrate uh, the strong partnership we have with a lot of the municipalities in these joint use agreements. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. And we'll look forward to that coming to the uh, board meeting next Tuesday. Uh, all right, so now we have a number of folks who will be here to help us think through, we ca we're calling it Trailers 101. Uh, we, we have been using uh, mobile units or trailers at schools for many, many years. We're gonna learn today about how old some of those trailers are. Uh, because sometimes these, uh, it, uh, this opportunity that has been phrased as being temporary uh, seems to have a longevity on the order of permanence. Uh, and so we really need to understand that as a board before we can make decisions in terms of what we should do about any of these kind of things. We really need to understand what's going on. So the main purpose of today is not about making any decisions but it's to build up that foundational understanding so that we can think about, all right, what should we do? And Arcel is here to be the instructor of record. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, members of the board, superintendent and staff. Thank you for allowing us some time to come in and uh, talk with you and share some information about trailers. We have a cross departmental team that provided collaborative input for this presentation as the varying responsibilities for trailers crosses many departments. Our team is here to answer questions that you may have, as well as Ms. Betty Parker, Senior Director of Real Estate Services, who supports trailer placements and removal processes by handling municipal communications and their varying UDO requirements for trailer placements. Next slide. We often receive questions about trailers, where there is a desire to understand what is a trailer. Why do we have them? Why can't we remove trailers from campuses with substantial numbers of units? And what is the cost for moving them? Today we want to provide an overview of the purpose, process, cost, time, and planning assumptions that affects our inventory of trailers. You also have a backup document to this presentation that shares the number of trailers on each campus sorted in descending order by board member. Next slide. Trailers are defined as pre-manufactured portable structures that are intended to serve as temporary academic or academic support spaces for schools. WCPSS has a range of trailers. We have single teaching space units. We have modular trailers with two or more classrooms. We have trailers that are used for restroom facilities. Trailer swing space sites where trailers accommodate not only teaching spaces, but also administration, the media center, your dining, and your PE. In use, WCPSS currently has 753 capacity trailers, 232 non-capacity trailers, and 20 retired trailers. Next slide. 
Having the ability to place trailers on school campuses allows us to change the capacity of a school to accommodate areas that are experiencing area growth changes. The number of trailers should not exceed the maximum number of classrooms that can be supported by core facilities, which are your dining spaces, your office support, your parking, your play fields, your quarters, your media center, restrooms, et cetera, and with consideration to site limitations and student safety. As defined in the CIP planning assumption guidelines, Standard campus core facilities are generally designed to accommodate four trailers at elementary and six trailers at middle and high schools where possible. Not all campuses can accommodate trailers. A campus that can accommodate trailers has an increase in on-site car stacking, parking spaces, and larger core facilities like the dining and media center. Retired trailers are those that can be removed or demolished and should not be in use by the school. Site limitations are expected to impact our ability to place trailers for capacity flexibility at future project sites. While we typically do not place pre-K, K, or first grade classes in trailers, the availability of trailers on campuses supported our ability to comply with House Bill 90 class size legislation for grades K through three. We were able to place upper grades and other programs in trailers while repurposing spaces within the brick and mortar building for additional teaching spaces for the younger grades. Next slide. If a school is capped, the school must accommodate students living in the base prior to the cap. Where possible, the ability to add or remove trailers allows us to adjust the school's capacity to handle increases in membership or the aging out of a neighborhood. We maintain a trailer move master plan for all campuses with trailers. But as you'll see in a few minutes, in, excuse me, in a few slides, some of the items that affect our ability to follow this master plan. The Office of Student Assignment and Long Range Planning, along with the individual school or schools, determine the priority order for trailer moves. Priority is given to schools with significant growth of base students, schools that are in close proximity to new residential developments, and schools that have changes in their program offerings. The delay in placement or removal of trailers impacts our, excuse me, our available campus capacity. Delayed trailer placement underestimates capacity and shows a temporary school enrollment cap may be needed. Delayed trailer removal overestimates capacity. This shows a temporary excess of available capacity at an existing school, which is not in need of additional capacity and creates assignment challenges. Next slide. Our experts share that 20 to 25 years should be the life of a trailer, but a well-made unit could last 35 to 40 years. We currently have just under 300 single trailers that are older than 31 years old. No new units have been purchased since 2005. Just to put this in context, the life of our brick and mortar buildings is typically 40 to 50 years. Maintenance and repairs for our 204 leased units are handled by the leasing company, and they bear the cost of those repairs unless the repairs are necessary due to vandalism or overuse. WCPSS is still responsible for repairs to these units related to bathroom fixtures, carpet, and finishes, and we provide the air filters. 
we are 100% responsible for repairs and maintenance to owned units. Trailers are regularly inspected like all classrooms and the inspection, in, excuse me, inspections include items like roofing, ramps, and HVAC. HVAC filters are changed regularly on all units, including the leased units. Trailers are inspected weekly for proper HVAC operation while class is not in session. Based on our maximal work orders, the maintenance cost for our trailers was $1.5 million per year over the last four years. Next slide. The number of trailers on a campus should not exceed the maximum number of classrooms that can be supported by core facilities. During our years of significant enrollment growth, it was not always possible to comply with this guidance. Therefore, we have many campuses, as you see in your backup document, that have exceeded the CIP planning assumption guidelines of four, six, and six at elementary, middle, and high, respectively. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Oh, there we go, thank you. Now let's discuss our ability to place trailers. The graph on this slide represents the cost to move multi-classroom modular trailer units with six to eight classrooms. In 2021, it cost $1.48 million plus design costs to move a seven classroom unit. The cost to move a single classroom trailer is approximately $100,000 plus design cost. Please note, costs are subject to change due to site conditions on the removal site as well as the placement site. As you can see from the graph, our ability to move trailer units has significantly decreased since 2014 due to increased cost. Other factors affecting the number of moves are limited vendors who bid on these types of projects. There's also stiff competition for available trailers as we are competing with other school systems and trailer move contractors. Some of the demand for trailers is global. It is a result of storms and weather events that destroy brick and mortar build structures. We are in competition with charter schools that are 100% uh, in trailers and other projects that need construction site trailers. The limited vendors and market impacts have significantly affected the bid prices. Not only has the cost of relocating trailers increased greatly, but the time needed to install them for use has increased significantly. From the time of a request to add a trailer to a campus to the time the unit is permitted and ready for occupancy is approximately one year. The cost and time needed to place trailers impacts our ability to use them to assist with crowding and it has made it increasingly difficult for us to use trailers as a quick fix to accommodate the student populations at over-enrolled schools. Next slide. As our enrollment is expected to level for the next 10 years, our goal is to set a strategic process of resetting the trailer move master plan and begin to remove some of the trailers from campuses with surplus numbers and older units. Moving forward, for new trailer placements, our process will stress compliance with the CIP planning assumptions, which specifies the number of trailers per campus. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. We are happy to answer any questions. As I mentioned, we have a broad group of folks here because it's literally across multiple departments responsibility for trailers. Thank you so much. Thank you, and floor is open for questions. Ms. Cash. Thank you for the presentation. It was great. Um, I have three questions. 
first question is, like if a trailer, um, a trailer that's leased, the air conditioning in that trailer is maintained by the leasing company or by us? And I'm going to bring uh, Mr. Slavic up to answer that question. We were trying not to have me up here winging it. <laughs> That's good forethought. Good, good forethought. <laughs> good afternoon. Uh, the leasing company does maintain the HVAC for leased uh, facilities. So how how fast do they move on fixing these compared? Uh, you know, why I'm asking that. It's just. I do. Should Part I of our guy daily who's, routine. Who's in charge calls. of the least? Um, you want to come up and answer that, Clint? Sure. <laughs> Let's get everybody up. Teamwork, there. teamwork. Yeah. I was everybody, saying, everybody, while everybody. you're coming up, I think it is important to reinforce that we apparently do change the filters yes. and inspect weekly. I just wonder how so, much at mercy we are yeah. with a leasing company to well, come in and get their air conditionings fixed promptly. Yeah. It is fixed promptly. I mean, sometimes there are instances where they have to order parts, a compressor or something like that, and it may take a few days, but they're, they're very proactive. Uh, they do fix the problems fairly quickly. That's good to know. Thank you. Uh -huh. I appreciate sure. that. Uh -huh. Second question will be, um, <laughs> so since trailers are so expensive to do anything with, do we um, have other options? I mean, have we thought out of the box on um, things like commercial property nearby, which is, I understand how if it's not like right there, it would be impossible. Are there other kinds of modular systems out there that can be brought in less expensive and moved out less expensive? Like those box cars that I love. And, uh, I think I know the answer to that question, but I'm going to bring Mr. Council back up here to answer that one again. So, so if I understand your question is, can we do something less expensive than what we're doing now? Not, not that I'm aware of. Uh, what we, uh, we, we, we did look a few years ago. We tried to, uh, uh, have some designed and built and brought in, but they were too expensive. Wow. Um, that was, I don't know, five, six years ago, something like that. You think we could do that again? I mean, I just, there's some other creative new things coming up that, not that I know much about it, but that are kind of new space delivery systems that might be something we could look at. Well, I'm just asking if we could. So I think it's worthwhile to bring any ideas uh, to the board and to uh, facilities, although, I, I mean, I think our staff do look for that. Um, you know, off-site locations have a lot of challenges. Um, so, you know, like a commercial site that next would door. Be we, less. Have commercial site, we don't have commercial sites next door to many of mm -hmm. our schools, and that's intentional mm -hmm. because we generally want commercial there's there's safety reasons right. why we don't that would be have. less that would be less of an option right. but i didn't know if there were some new types of units that are out there but what i would like to highlight and and i think we're we're exploring the utility of, or how useful it will be but i believe it was in the uh, Fuqua, in the new fukui middle school design recall that we designed was it four or six six, cla six, six classrooms six. We put into the design of that building that are intended to be the kind of flexible space because it's actually dollars wise cheaper to build it into the original brick and mortar. And particularly there, it was, we were site limited. There was no way that there, you would be able to put a trailer on the space. So I would I'd say that classifies as innovative thinking. And I think, as we discussed when that plan came to us, I think there our biggest challenge is, so you've got these rooms that are intended to be used for capacity should you need it. Before you need it, are you going to just let the room sit there empty? Probably not, which means the school is likely going to make use of those spaces for various purposes, all of which are going to be valid. 
And then what, what is going to happen in that school? What is the board going to do when capacity crunch comes? Are we going to say, oh, we have to remove some of this programming because that was intended for increased core or not? So I think that's the challenge of building it in is, you know, how do you deal with te temporary space that's permanently built in? But we're building it for capacity reasons. We're, we're building it for capacity, capacity reasons. So I would assume we would take it back as a classroom. We have to, again, if we're building it for capacity reasons, we have to do it. So I think that's out of the box thinking. So I do think it is cheaper, yeah. but it, it adds an additional level of challenge. Yeah, I think yeah. there's a, I think it's, what this is sounding like to me is maybe a series of questions um, that get asked as a part of consideration of putting mobile units on a site or removing them that include, well, there's a there's the overall question of what other options might exist in the last few years out there around space solutions that, that are not ones that we traditionally have looked at. Mm -hmm. are, is there anything new out there? That's one thing that we can certainly take a look at. But I think the other turns into a series of questions because the sites are also different and the needs may not always be the same. So is it whether it's flexible space already exists in the building, which I, and I think what where Dr. Martin may have been headed is principals will figure out how to use spaces in their buildings. Mm -hmm. And they, spaces are often used for purposes for which they were not originally intended. Mm -hmm. And then when we need to use them for the purpose for which they were originally intended, there is a bit of a pain point with that. But So we need to have a series of questions. And we're actually in the middle of a process right now for how we standardize a little bit more the use of spaces for purposes other than for which they were intended. Because sometimes it puts us in a corner when we need to use those spaces for the purposes for which they were intended. So, so we're, mm -hmm. we're looking at that process already. But it's just, it, I think it's a series of questions in terms of the cost, where, the purpose, um, whether or not other options have been explored. There are, you know, when a school is approaching 40-some trailers like Garner High School many years ago, the solution there was to start mm -hmm. over, right, with a whole new school that accommodated a larger number of students. But I kept thinking in terms of the space that was being taken up, you could have put a whole classroom wing um, mm -hmm. there that was built <laughs> instead of the trailers. The issue then becomes the temporary capacity need when you take those kids out of the trailer. So I think there's a series of questions that probably need to be asked and, and maybe there are more, um, a little more transparency around that process um, because I'm sure a lot of questions I'm talking about are in fact asked um, when those, before a recommendation comes to the board. But I think the discussion helps sort of uncover the kinds of things that you're hearing and seeing that may become questions that, that become part of the formal process. Mm -hmm. If Thank I may, you. that sound, oh, I'm oh. sorry. That sounds like a lot, oh, it sounds, you're right. There's a giant number of things that can happen and so there is a whole process. I'm glad to hear that. Mm -hmm. If I may add one other uh, point to that discussion. We did make that decision at the Fuquay Verena Middle School site to add the six additional classrooms inside the building. Um, Mr. Carrozza and I have held the capacity for that school at the 1248, which is the base capacity, mm -hmm. and we will have some additional conversations with the principal uh, once we get a little bit closer to moving into that building. However, one other thing to keep in mind is that our capital improvement program has a set number of dollars per year. So anytime there's a decision to actually move additional classes into a building, that's additional funding that has to be found immediately. The trailer move line item that you saw in one of your slides, that's for something that's happening a little bit further down the road and could not, I, I don't think, accommodate going and making a cross the, 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 a sweeping decision to move all trailer classrooms into the building. So it would have a direct impact to how many schools could get done in that, that window, because you know it's, it's a rolling plan, it's updated annually. So it would impact the number of schools, and then of course many of you are aware of what's currently happening with inflation and other COVID results, et cetera, et cetera. So there are lots of things that are pulling on that funding right now. So I, I just wanted to throw that out there. It's not built in automatically and making that decision would impact other projects mm -hmm. that are in line for potential renovation or replacement or brand new schools. Thank you. So my I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. My final question is, um, if it's so expensive to remove trailers, why do we remove them rather than just leave them? I mean, 
like 1.8 million, 1.5 million dollar, no. Whatever it taught, I mean, that would really help another school probably fix their toilets or something. Mm -hmm. So I would prefer to leave the, I mean, I'm just trying to understand do, how we, go ahead, mm -hmm. adding to that? Yeah, if, yeah. If, if I could, that was. Thank you, sorry, Ms. Roy. That was a question that, that mm -hmm. I had, which was when you get to the end of the lifespan of, of, the, of the unit, if it's either you don't have funds in the budget to move it, but it's gone past its life cycle. Mm -hmm. Is it kept? Can it be used for non-classroom use, storage? Can it be used for limited classroom use, like specials? Or does it just sit vacant, kind of derelict there on the campus? Thank you so much for that combo question. And those are very good questions. It's a combination of things. Uh, you may re uh, remember a term called mothballing. Um, so you can call it retired, you can call it mothballing, you can call it a, a couple different things. And that intention is that that school, that, that trailer is not being used at that school for classroom or instructional purposes. However, as you heard me mention in a couple presentations recently, the COVID impact happened. And so we actually opened up a lot of class, um, trailer teaching spaces that were intended to be retired or mothballed. So again, as uh, Superintendent Moore just mentioned, part of our process will be having those conversations. Once it's mothballed, you don't have the option of just simply going and opening up a mothballed mm -hmm. trailer without some additional conversation and consideration. However, I know Mr. Council's back here probably chomping at the bit to come back up here because also as far as removing trailer units, there's a whole process to go through with that. So we can, by all means, leave units on a site, consider it retired or mothballed, but we can't also just simply pull them off. Sometimes if they can't be sold, if they can't, um, uh, if we don't have the money to remove them, sometimes they're demolished on site as well. So depending on the condition. And Mr. Council, I don't know if you want to add anything additional to that. Yeah, okay, thank you. Ms. Roy, can I just yes, follow up on, on, on that? Um, all that makes sense for own trailers. Mm -hmm. My question is, it almost needs a second answer. What, 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 are, what does all that do for lease trailers? Right, if we lease a car, and it's done with its lifetime or even stop making payments, then the car company comes and, and takes it back. So what are our costs? Well, do we have any mothballed lease trailers? I guess is question number one. And question number two is what are costs that we would incur to, a le to, to remove a lease trailer? And if there are costs, should we differently negotiate our lease contracts going forward? There are no leased mothballed units Good. that I'm aware of. Uh, um, <clears throat> the expense for the leased unit is a single classroom unit, we pay $250 a month for it something like that. If when we turn it back into the company, we do have to pay for any damage to that unit and we have to pay moving costs. Uh, as far as the uh, renegotiation of the lease, that's coming up in June of 22. So that can be done. That's usually a five year master lease agreement. Was there another question in there I missed? We move, we're not going to move a trailer if it's moss balled for any reason. I mean, except maybe in a lease. But yeah. we don't just remove trailers to get them off the property, do we? Uh, no. It, well, if you're renovating a, or building a new school, we would get we would return that, them or remove that, them. but yeah. not just to open up land no, for any non-reason. No. There, it, there would be a reason. Either yeah. it's on program space and you want the program space back, there's a safety hazard, there's a construction project around it, there's something else that precipitates moving it because otherwise it's an, ex, it's an expense that where those yeah. dollars might be better spent somewhere else. Is there, are our lease trailer, the leased trailers in more high demand areas? Are the lease trailers the newer trailers owned older? What, in general, what, what differentiates our lease versus owned? 
up in general, I'd say the least, the school system leases mostly single classroom trailers. So they're, I'd say, 80s and 90s, early 2000. Uh, um, I don't think the price of the lease of those is too bad at $250 a month, but they've been getting that $200 for 20 years, mm -hmm. you know. So, um, just so you know, we spend $1.2 million a year leasing modular units. That's for 83 modular units. Leasing. Yeah, just in lease cost alone, 1.2 million. Yeah. Well, now is the now is the time yeah. to have that conversation. I mean, we, we've dedicated a fair amount of time today for this discussion. So go ahead. Exactly. And so I know this is another reason in addition to the capping and the buses and expenses and all that in high capacity areas that I don't know why in elementary, especially if not middle, that we're not talking more about multi-tracking those schools. It's not because I'm so pro multi-track schools, it's, it's because they're used for capacity. So if, if we have lease trailers and we have cap schools and we have transportation going everywhere, all very expensive, it sounds like to me. I don't know. I may have calculated it wrong. I just want to be sure we talk about that when we're talking about the tipping point for when a, a school or an area goes to year-round versus or multi-track versus doing all of this. Yes. I think that's partly why we're having the multi-track year-round discussion is trying to come up with principles because I think you're absolutely right. This needs to be factored in. I mean, there are costs to going multi-track year-round. Mm -hmm. How do those costs weigh against the costs of things like trailers? I mean, those are things we need to be able to look at very carefully. Speaking of costs, you noted that we spend about $1.5 million per year on trailer maintenance. Um, so there's a lot of these things adding up, right? So $1.2 million a year on the lease, but $1.5 million a year uh, for maintenance. How does that maintenance per square foot for a trailer compare to maintenance per, per square foot for brick and mortar? Thank you. I knew that question was going to happen, and I, I wish I had more time to do the math. They, they're relatively close. Okay. Um, I wouldn't say that the maintenance money that we spend on trailers is excessive beyond what we spend on the building. Maybe slightly, just because it's, you know, it's all roof, it's all, you know, exterior walls, that sort of thing. But I don't think it's, um, it's not excessive to the point that it's it's uh, not feasible. Sure. Thank you. Other questions, issues of discussion? Dr. So going back a little bit to, to Mrs. Cash, and we've had this before, but you can't count on me to recall. Uh, I mean, are we going to dig a little deeper into kind of, to Ms. Cash's question, when we have these CAP schools, how, how much does it change our ability um, to not have these, to, to reduce the number of trailers, which is a large part of this conversation, at least the costs associated with it, or are we really not gaining seats? And I, and I think that's that's a conversation we have to have. We also have to have it publicly so that people know that these, clearly, I, I've never said one way or the other how I feel about multi-track. I'm a parent who've only been on traditional. So for me, it really is about what's the gain here and how do we have this larger conversation for the impact this has on our whole community. Because even if you don't have a cap school in your community, it impacts how we do assignment. It impacts everything. It impacts transportation. So I, so I guess my, my follow-up to Mrs. Cash is, is how do we begin to have that conversation in one, make sure I understand it before we start to have it? <laughs> I think I understand what you're asking, and part of it... And it may not be for you. It's just a okay. larger conversation for us because they are associated to each other. Right? Certainly. Like, we, I think, I'm a, and I'm not going to put words in Ms. Cash's mouth, but they're all levers that we can't pull one at a time. Right. 
and they so, domino. And yeah. one of the uh, the next presentations that we'll be bringing to the board at the end of the year deals with capping recommendations. If you'll recall, last year we we did not recommend removing any caps on existing schools. We recommended adding, I think it was four schools to the capping list, and then we, for the first time, preemptively capped a school. Um, so that is certainly a conversation I'd like to have before we bring those capping recommendations uh, to the board in December. I, I will just re um, reiterate something Dr. Martin was alluding to mm -hmm. um, earlier. As part of the year-round discussion that we've started, mm -hmm. this purpose and when mm -hmm. and why a school is designated as a multi-track year-round school is a really important component to this. Mm -hmm. Is it only for capacity, or is it also for parental choice? And is it sometimes both, but are they, or are they exclusive sometimes from each other? Because um, a sort of a, coral, a parallel process that needs to go with that is if a school is converted to a multi-track year round for capacity, mm -hmm. then we also need to be able to communicate what is what and if there is an exit strategy for that. Mm -hmm. um, there's, an, there's another district, uh, one of the fastest growing districts in the country a few years back in uh, Clark County, Nevada, Las Vegas, that converted many schools to multi-track year round. But they did it, they had a multi-year plan where there was a, a school being built in the area or capacity that would come online at a certain amount of time and that school would then return back to a traditional calendar. So I think there's there's a piece to this that's about, if it's about capacity, mm -hmm. the question that our families are gonna ask who don't want to be in a multi-track year round school who are in a high growth area is, is there or what is the exit strategy for it? And I think that's all of that is part of what needs to come in the year round discussion that's happening. I think that's great. I'm glad you brought that up, um, Superintendent Moore, because I think it is, there is an exit strategy and I think like there's if a school, if we don't need the capacity, I've always thought of it as a capacity, because mm -hmm. that's how it was trained. It was capacity, not necessarily choices. And because it was what we, the area needed, what a community, what a school system needed. But I know that things have changed, but I do think that's great, because you're talking about the, the tipping point on the top and the bottom, and when we get back with a new school coming, if people know they can multi-track, for so many years because they're getting a new school, I think that's good for the community. So thank you for bringing that up. Other questions, discussion? Mr. Agerty, looks like you're ready. Yeah, I, I didn't want to jump in if anyone else had any other questions. But I, th I think all of this is very useful because especially as we get into reassignment and some of these other questions, you know, when we look at the facility utilization and the capacity at different schools, no, you, th there's the calculation that we make about are the trailers on site, how many trailers on site, but in some cases knowing the age of the trailers on site, mm -hmm. where they are in terms of their lifespan is gonna be significant. You know, I have a school in my district, large elementary school that has a lot of trailers. Mm -hmm. With the construction of a new school in the area, it's gonna look like that school is going to be made severely under capacity. But if a large number of those trailers that may be 30 plus years old are retired, mm -hmm. once they're gone, it'll be back at that healthy balance mm -hmm. that we're looking for. And so it's sort of another level. First there's the seats in the building, then there are the seats in the trailers, but then maybe how long will those trailers be there? And again, whether or not they're carted off, whether they're demolished, whether or not they're retired on site, mm -hmm. if they're not in use, we need to factor that in as we make our assignment decisions. Well, to add to that, uh, Chris, it reminds me of a piece that we talked about in the pre-planning meeting. You know, we, ha we also have to be very thoughtful. If we remove a mobile unit from a site, mm -hmm. there's a lot of municipal guidelines that mm -hmm. would say, you ain't never putting it back on that site. Um, and, and so, you know, mm -hmm. if we've got this, you know, fluctuation, we try to work with our municipalities as best we can, but we've run into some issues in the past where, you know, basically they've said, nope, no more mobiles, or mobiles have mm -hmm. to be, 
you know, on a different kind of foundation or, or something mm -hmm. like that. So we need to be very thoughtful. We can't, if we take a mobile off, it may never be going back onto that site and therefore we wouldn't have that capacity to go back to. So there's just, it's such a multifaceted uh, challenge. Mm -hmm. All right, any further questions? Well, thank you, Ms. Rory. Uh, you. Very helpful, and, and team. Uh, very helpful information. Um, you know, it's, it's one of the critical pieces mm -hmm. to the puzzle of assignment, facilities, mm -hmm. the whole works. It, it, these really are a multi-dimensional multi puzzle. Yes. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, those were the two primary items on today's agenda. Uh, what we have decided to do in our planning for these meetings is to always have a, 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 an opportunity for new business uh, that might come. Uh, I want to let you know that um, in our discussions, we haven't set in stone what the future uh, agendas will be. There's been, there's been a lot of interest in having discussions about air quality. Um, come to facilities committee meeting, and we, we, we talked very seriously about, about having a discussion about that today, but our facilities staff um, are busy making sure our air quality <laughs> is strong, and j it just did not seem uh, appropriate to say, why don't you guys stop what you're doing, put a presentation together for the board, because they really need to be out in the field. Uh, so. Our plan is to have a discussion on uh, what's been done with air quality uh, in our facilities at our upcoming October meeting. So look for that. In the meantime, uh, in my uh, discussion with uh, Mr. Strickland, um, I just asked, you know, can you give me some bullet points to share with the public what has been done with respect uh, to the HVAC? And so just three quick bullet points so that people are aware of what has been done. Uh, we've upgraded all of our filters to MERV 13. Um, uh, where, where, well, all the systems that can handle the additional pressure. So the, the, the finer your filter, the more pressure it takes to push the air through that filter. Uh, so there, uh, are a few older systems that can't handle that additional pressure, and so they have to have the, the lower filter. I'm sure we'll get an update on how many of those there are uh, and where there are the limitations, but um, we have updated uh, all filters. Um, we have not determined if airflow volumes are affected. Um, we simply, with, uh, with the higher filter, we simply don't have the staff to go and, and uh, uh, evaluate the airflow in all systems. However, uh, what is being done, which somewhat addresses the issue if you've got lower air filter flow because of the higher filter, is that we're running our systems for extended periods of time in occupied mode even when the building is not occupied. And what that does is it brings in a lot of additional fresh air into the system. In all your HVA systems, you've got a mix of recirculated air and fresh air. So if we run them longer in occupied modes when people aren't there, that increases the mix of fresh air into the system. He also notes that the exhaust systems are regularly checked and uh, it, to, make, to ensure that they are working properly. So a lot of work has been done to make sure that our HVAC systems are operating properly, there has been that increased filtration, the added uh, air mix uh, into the system. So these are all important steps to make sure that our first line of defense is that system HVAC. That's, that's what handles large capacity rooms. A lot of people are talking about the small, you know, in-room air, air filters. Few of those are designed for large capacity rooms. They're more designed for a, a household bedroom or, or something on that order. So your best line of defense for ventilation in an industrial facility, which our schools are, is the major HVA system. So that's just a quick summary. We're gonna get much more detail 
uh, about that at next month's um, facilities committee meeting. Other things that are on tap um, are continued discussion on the principles for multi-track year round assignments. Uh, current plans are to bring more of that discussion uh, to the October meeting. We have a lot of things listed for the October meeting, so they're not going to all be on the October meeting because we can't afford to have overloaded, class, uh, overloaded schedules. My sense is the air quality and multi-track year round will probably be the two main things for October. We also have on deck talking about the primp and snap programs. There's been a lot of question. Uh, not only what have we done with the primp and snap dollars, but how does something get on deck to be considered for either the primp or snap program? So that is forthcoming. That initially had been scheduled for October, but I'm, I'm sensing that, that that will probably get pushed maybe more toward uh, uh, November, uh, December. The other thing is we recognize that we, you know, while the budget really kicks into high gear come March, a lot of the planning uh, that goes into any business cases for budget needs to start earlier. And one of the uh, things that we've talked about uh, multiple times is getting the maintenance and operation uh, allocations in the budget up to a more industry recognized standard for you know, how much should be in our maintenance and operation budget based on our square footage. So we want to we want to get that discussion this fall so that some of that business case can be ready by the time we get to budget decisions. So those are kind of the four things that we have uh, on deck as new business to look forward to in the next couple of months. Uh, are there any other things people would like to raise or questions about those? Uh, Ms. Cash, then Ms. Carter. Or did I see, Ms. Ms. Moore, did you? Oh, I, I, I don't. I just wanted to add one additional item yeah. that um, just a preview for you. So, um, at the uh, the the first October at the first October board meeting, you will have a an uh, agenda item to, uh, for the MOU for the proposed early college high school at the Wake Tech RTP campus. This is just the MOA that, mm -hmm. that spells out the agreements between us. Um, we will likely have it be an action item. It follows the standard protocols that we have for MOAs, but there are a couple of variations and considerations that changes that have occurred in the process for applying for a cooperative innovative high school where we feel that would be a really good opportunity to discuss what some of those are and what that timeline looks like. Uh, this is the school that is intended to open in the fall of 22, fall of 22. Um, and so, uh, and, and I think that's delayed by a year already. So, um, but there, there are just a couple of pieces in legislation that have changed in the process for cooperative innovative high schools, potential funding. Um, and so we want to make sure that you are prepared, not just for the sort of standard MOA, but how that, what all that it kicks off after that. So. Thank you. And if we need to bring elements of that to mm -hmm. facilities, obviously uh, we will, but, it, but coming to the work session makes good sense. <laughs> Ms. Cash. So, I'm sorry, oh. and the naming. It, part, a piece of that will also be the naming for the school that is coming forward. So there's just a number of things that will happen in October. Um, uh, she, I thought she was saying gaming over there, and I'm like, okay, what? And then, I, then she did the sign language, and I knew what she was doing. Okay, all right. Thank you. <laughs> that was good. Ms. I like that sign language. Um, so when we were talking about the, so I'd like to hear this thing that you guys mentioned about the HVAC systems running longer that circulates the air. So th would that mean then, because I know that we have some struggles in our schools, when in our new schools, when the air, it's motion censored for the air conditioner. And so when they go out the recess, it shuts off. And when they, or the temperature goes down to like, anyhow, when they come in, it's really warm in those rooms. And that's exactly when we'd like it not to be warm in the rooms. And I can't imagine we're sa we might be saving some money, but I don't know how much we're saving. Okay, that's uh, Mr. Strickland's here. I'm sure Mark will take note of that. Nate's going to take that. <laughs> Mr. Slavic.
You know, I was going to leave right after the trailer's presentation. I think I missed my opportunity. <laughs> um, so those setback, um, uh, the setbacks that we use for classroom, it, it is for energy savings. It doesn't set back the system per se. So the system is still running in occupied mode. The air handler that serves the greater area is still admitting outside air to the room. Um, what we're not doing is we're not cooling the room down to the set point temperatures when the kids are in the classroom. Um, it has been kind of, um, sometimes it works pretty well and sometimes it doesn't. So as we get new facilities and we find that it doesn't recover very well, like when kids come back to the classroom, it takes a little bit, an excessive amount of time, we do make adjustments um, with the building automation department to try and change that. And we usually get feedback from staff uh, to say that, hey, exactly as you've described. They come back, it's really warm, it takes a while, and then our staff will make an adjustment or, or you know, some rooms just can't handle it and we'll disable it in those rooms that uh, it doesn't provide a good environment. When you say an adjustment, what does that mean? Um, into, into the programming for the, for the system. So um, without getting too deep into it, just into the, um, the software um, for how so quickly it it's supposed to recover not down as much or um it depends on the system it really depends on it, it can be uh how much air is admitted to the space while it's uh, unoccupied or it can be um or, or how far we set it back yes and i and i would encourage um if you are aware of schools or classrooms where concerns or complaints because it's not working properly or they don't think it's working properly, we might need to, to run that down and see whether or not it is. Will I just tell their area soups or? Well, they probably through the principal and the work order process, would that be the best way to do it? And then we just need to make sure that we're looking at those and, and following up timely. You sure it has to go through the work order process? <laughs> I think that if a principal wants to send an email as well, that that's a good backup. That's good. So a question I'd have related to that is, it strikes me, I mean, are we, from my perspective, we don't have enough recess time. Our recess time is really pretty short. So it strikes me that if we have any setback during recess time, that can't be doing much in terms of energy savings. I mean, I understand some overnight could give us some energy savings, but even a half hour really isn't. So particularly uh, with the need for additional uh, airflow right now, why would we not even disable any setbacks during the occupied hours in a building? Sure, um, and, and obviously this, this happens any time if a class goes to specials, if they go right. to, whenever they leave the room. Um, and it's over a period of time, so if it's, I don't know what the duration needs to be for that sequence to kick in, um, if it's 15 minutes, if it's 30 minutes. Um, but like I said, we've disabled it at quite a few facilities. Um, we get the motion sensors for the lights and we tie it into the building automation and it's kind of a standard practice that predates me. Um, but yeah, if it, if it does cause, believe me, I don't want to cause any more problems than I have to deal with every day. Sure. So if, we, if it does make sense to disable it or to change it, you know, we, we do do that. I'll do a okay. resounding vote for disabling the air changes. <laughs> yeah, that, would, that, that seems like something that, that should be looked into because we're not going to save, m lights are a different story. They easily can come on, but I mean, even from an energy standpoint, it's easier to often maintain temperature than it is to change rapidly. So, uh, yeah, looking into that would be useful. Sure. Thank you. Ms. Carter? Well, this was just something, another area, I, and again, I don't know if this is for facilities or not, but the outdoor classrooms and learning spaces in existing schools um, that did not, that were not built, and how to address that so, you know, with schools that are able to fund and do things, um, they may be able, to do, be able to do X, Y, and Z versus another school they, that might not have that support and how we can address that district-wide so that um, more of our schools have opportunities to have that outdoor space and just kind of approach it at a more equitable level instead of 
whoever can afford it. And that is an important discussion. I mean, I, I, I think we all can be very pleased with the outdoor classrooms that have been incorporated into new construction. But, you know, here again, this is the challenge that we struggle with all the time in the, on the board from a capital perspective is how do you minimize the inequities between new construction and old construction? Um, you know, so every time we talk about capital planning, renovations, I think this is actually a, a, a piece that would be worthwhile to include into the primp and snap uh, discussion because it strikes me that the, particularly the primp could be, could possibly be an avenue for building um, outdoor classrooms in our older schools that aren't part of a big, right? We, we do well when we do a, mate, a big renovation. But the whole purpose of Primp and Snap is because there were so many things that are at that intermediate level that just fall through the cracks and never ra raise to a level. So uh, yeah, that needs to continually be on our mind, but, but I think that is a, a particularly good idea to bring up when we focus on the Primp and Snap uh, issues, because that may be the place where we can get some work done. Okay, uh, Douglas, do you want to give us a rundown of the three month forecast? Good afternoon, everybody. Good to see you all again. Okay, um, three months looking ahead. Um, as several noted today, uh, next Tuesday, of course, uh, the second board meeting for the month of September. A couple highlights for you. Uh, we'll be bringing the LS3P design contract for Swift Creek Elementary School and also the CMAR contract for JE Dunn for Swift Creek Elementary School as well. Moving into October, uh, first board meeting would be uh, October 5th. A couple highlights there. We plan to bring the Barnhill CMAR contract for E49 as well as the Clancy and Thays CMAR contract for E53. Also planning a couple of other additional highlights to bring the facility assessment contracts for uh, the uh, assessments being done by maintenance and operations as well as uh, the one being led by FDNC. Moving into mid-October, as, as Dr. Martin shared, that would be our next facilities committee meeting. A couple highlights uh, with respect to that meeting. As he noted, we expect to bring a, a year-round schools update as well as HVAC uh, ventilation update as well. Moving down into uh, the early part of November, uh, planning to bring the design contract for DLR for E53 at the first meeting in November. Uh, moving down into uh, mid-November, that would be uh, November 10th, would be our next facilities committee meeting for that month after October. And as Dr. Martin noted, uh, planning uh, SNAP primp, that process update, which would be on deck, looking to potentially bring that to you all in that meeting. Uh, and then lastly, the second board meeting of November, uh, planning at this point to bring you the design contract for Skinner, Farlow, Kerwin for the E49 project. Any questions? Thank you. Questions or comments? No? All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you, everyone, for participating. I uh, hope the information was helpful. I think, uh, and, and thank you for the new business discussion. I think, uh, you know, this is something that uh, is good practice for us uh, in committees to think about, you know, work that we need to be doing. Uh, seeing no other business and having, con yeah, go ahead. Mr. I really appreciate that about the new business because I remember there was a time when I was on a board that we used to do that at every meeting practically. So we had an option to publicly state some things that we had some concerns about. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we, we, we can't always get everything done, but there, but there needs to be a mechanism to at least get it on the table, uh, you know, to, to raise issues, uh, you know, as you did. Right, the, the, the air temperature shutdown during the day. I mean, those are small things that don't need a full business item, but uh, can stand to be, be looked at. So again, thank you all for your participation, having concluded the business. Um, 
This is the facilities committee meeting of today stands adjourned. Thank you all.